Virginia Tech has had a pretty good relationship compared to a lot of colleges uh, when it comes to the monarchy. A young professor by the name of Samuel R. Cook and Jeffrey Corntassel years ago started coming to our church with a minister that lived here in Blacksburg, B. Lord, got to know our people. I was a teenager at the time. Sam would talk to us, and, and you know, Sam has written a book, Soul Boat to Monken, so well versed in, in that. And, you know, Sam, I think, was very instrumental in starting a program here at Virginia Tech. And, you know, uh, uh, we consider him part of our family, too. And uh, we're very proud of that fact. Uh, the president today, thank you for doing this. And you know, if you want to keep a people down, you keep them uneducated. If you look at the communist countries in this world, that's what they do with the masses. They keep them uneducated. And you know, without education today, you can't rise. And if you can't rise, you can't bring your children up into a better world. And, you know, I... I went away for college. I felt like I owed it to my coaches and the people that had gotten helped get that scholarship. But when I came home, I knew I needed to stay home and help my mom. My mom would never ask me. She would, she would have died trying. But I remember one August morning, she said, son, it ain't time for you to be getting ready to go back to school. I was going to school up in Pennsylvania. And I said, and she was behind me, and I said, well, Mom, uh, I prayed about it, and I'm going to stay here and help you get those girls through high school. That was Dad's dream, and we done it. And today, the last one, the baby who's here with me today, she's the youngest, and she'll let you know in a heartbeat. 
But when she walked across that stage, my mom looked at me and she grabbed my hands and said, son, we did it. I said, no, mom, you did it. That's the strongest person, person that I ever known was my mom. And, you know, I'm going to tell you one more story about how important the land is to the Monicans. For my grandmother, her birthday today, so I guess I'm honoring her in telling this. In the Great Depression, my grandfather went to Johnson City, Tennessee, where there is a large group of Monicans today, and he, he was looking for work. He got a job on a railroad, and my grandma was telling me, and she said, son, and she always called me son, she said, son, he came back in the house, and he was grinning from ear to ear and said, Cammy, pack your bags. I got a job. We're going to move to Tennessee. And, you know, I was a little boy when she told me, I said, Grandma, what did you say? She said, well, son, I told him, I said, you know, I've been to Tennessee. I didn't care for it. I didn't leave anything up there. But if you want to go to Tennessee, I'll pack your bag and you can go, but I'm not going with you. So, you know, we came that close to maybe moving away too. But the love of the land kept that woman here. And, you know, I'll be honest with you. If I'd have been born 50 years earlier, I don't know if, and I consider myself a very brave and uh, hardcore person for staying here, but if I was born 50 years young, I don't know if I could have stayed here with the racism and the things that they put up with. I really don't know if I could have. But they did, and thank God that they had a connection to the land so strong that nothing you could put before them, they couldn't ride above it. They were proud, proud people, and I'm so proud to be a part of that tree. And we will always be here, and I want to thank Virginia Tech for educate, putting an uh, institution like this on our land. We need more of them. And it is your responsibility to make sure our people have the opportunity to be educated. I'm not asking you to lower your standards, no. We just need to be able to financially able to come here and get the education that you have given. I think Rufus majored in history, and you know, uh, he he knows the history of the Monacan real well. And you know, uh, someday he may be the chief. And uh, I don't know if he'd want that responsibility right now with the things going on. But you know, it's a job that uh, somebody got to do it, as the old saying goes. And uh, I want to thank y'all for you know, honoring Rufus and myself because it gave us an opportunity to, to honor some of our people that made us who we were. You know, Lacey, my mom, Rufus talked about her, and like I said, I mentioned her too. Very, very strong, and you know, I'm talking about mostly women, but you know, the men was there too. You know, and they did the things that the men had to do. They went out and worked, brought home food, protected us, taught us how to be respectful women and young men. And, you know, so, yes, we've had rough times, but, you know, I wouldn't change them for nothing because they've made us who we are today. Thank you and for what you're doing here. Thank you, Rufus. Thank you, Chief Branham, for situating this moment socially, culturally, geographically, historically, generationally, financially. Um, 
uh, it's, uh, I cherish your willingness to be in relationship with Virginia Tech. So thank you for being here. Luckily, next we get to hear from a Virginia Tech president, Tim Sands, who convened the Council on Virginia Tech History, which made possible the markers that we're here to unveil and celebrate today. Um, Dr. Sands is the first Virginia Tech president to have an ongoing open dialogue with tribal leaders of the territory that is now Virginia. Please welcome President Sands. Well, thank you very much. And, and thank you, um, Rufus and Chief Branham, for sharing your heartfelt stories. It's so good to see you in person on this land again. Uh, we've done the virtual thing now for two years. It's so wonderful to be back in community. But every time I hear both of you speak, it, it uh, just hits you to the core. And uh, you, you know, keep telling stories, because it, 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 it's the best way to communicate and to uh, share with us uh, your life stories and the, the histories of your people. Just incredible. Thank you. We've tried with the, with the Council on VT History to tell another set of stories that overlap with the ones you just heard. And I'd just like to thank the Council for taking us on, Bob Leonard and uh, Minna and everybody who was involved in the Council's work. Just extraordinary work over four years. Not clear where it was headed initially, and then it all sort of gelled, and, and here we are our sesquicentennial, and we have a chance to celebrate the great work that you've done. And it won't stop in the sense that uh, this is the beginning of another set of stories, a bigger, larger communication of our history. And I'm so proud of what the council has done. So thank you for, for all that. Thank you. And But on behalf of Virginia Tech, I do want to thank um, Rufus Elliott and Chief Brandon for welcoming me and for welcoming all of our guests here on the traditional homeland of the Monacan people the original stewards and historical custodians of this land. As we mark 150 years since the founding of our institution in this place, we acknowledge the impact of Native peoples and their struggles past and present. We understand that the loss of land and opportunity is a part of our institution's legacy. It's essential that we learn from our history and broaden our impact by reaching out to descendant communities and engaging our responsibility to support those who have been traditionally underserved and overlooked. We are very pleased to have Rufus Elliott with us today as the first enrolled Monacan student to graduate from Virginia Tech. And Rufus, I'd like you to come forward uh, for um, uh, a presentation of some items that we think will um, hopefully set this in your memory, this event. Um, I'd like to have Vicki Ferguson to come forward, Director of Solitude. Hello, everyone. So Rufus has taken upon himself an enormous job, which is to help preserve not only our language, but many of our songs. And so today, we're going to honor him with something that's going to help him do that. These are eastern woodland rattles. These are one of the types of rattles that our ancestors made a long time ago. And Rufus, I want to honor you with this today. Because we have, we have one more item at least. Um, I, I wanted to present Rufus with Virginia Tech Land Grant University, 1872 to 1997, The History of a School, a State, and a Nation by Peter Wallenstein. And I just want to mention that this is a rewrite, an extensive rewrite, as part of the uh, council's work. And, um, and you're getting this, I think, pretty much hot off the press. There's another um, version, maroon version, which extends past 1997 that is in, in the works. But this will get you started. Thank you, sir. We are also pleased and honored to have Chief Kenneth Branham here with us today, as you all heard. I appreciate his comments about the Monacan relationship with Virginia Tech. 
Chief Brandon, would you please come forward? Vicki, would you like to get started? So um, we can't have Rufus having a rattle without the chief having one as well. I'm not sure it's going to help him call the meetings to order, but it may help him sing a little bit on his way home. <laughs> And Chief Brandon, I also would like you to present you with a, with a replica of one of these panels, uh, Native Stewardship and the Monacan People, so two of these actually, and they're right here. But uh, we'd like to have you um, be able to display that, and uh, we, we appreciate you being here and the stories that you've told over the years and the, the relationship, the partnership going forward. So thank you. Sure. Yes. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, thank you, everybody that's here. I want to make a comment. I was reading the uh, panel, and you know, since federal recognition, we have been rolling so fast with new programs, new things for our people. We, we've uh, moved the office uh, into a permanent building now, and uh, you know, we have been able to acquire the land. And, you know, I've told our young people, I've told Rufus, uh, we got the property, now you go build the rest of our dream. And uh, I was looking at the very bottom of this and was talking about Rassavac, piece of land that belongs to the Monicans. It was one of our major trade cities uh, in the 1700s. Uh, Captain John Smith actually visited that and documented it. Uh, the last Monicans were in uh, around the 1730s, 1740s when they moved uh, out. But that was a major settlement. And it was as big as a lot of European cities. And 2014, uh, Fluana County and Louisa County County next there discovered they needed more water. James River, Riviana comes right together there. And they decided the best place to put that, the cheapest place would be on that point, which just happened to be the location of Rasavac. Of course, back then they didn't have to contact us. We weren't federal recognized. But in 2007, I think out of courtesy, they did come and talked to us, but they told us that there was no other route. It had to be there. They had even acquired four acres to put the building on. Uh, the way they did it, the landowners weren't very happy with the way they had done it, so they weren't too happy with it. And our representative, Karen Wood, we just did an honoring thing for her recently, uh, told our chief, Dean Brownham at the time, that there was something not quite right about the whole deal. Gut feeling. We talked to our attorneys. They went in and found out that the archaeologists had done their work, weren't qualified by the state of Virginia, and everything they had done was called into question. We told them we will fight this to the Supreme Court. We had a law firm that didn't charge us a penny. They said, we believe in this. We will do it, whatever we need to do. And they made the comment they went with this route because it was the cheapest. By the time we get through, it will be the most expensive. <laughs> you know, the old saying, money talks. Well, they, they had to talk. But anyway, two weeks ago, they we gave them an alternative route. We got them to hire archaeologists that we felt good about. And last week, I went and signed the paper. Of course, they wrote it up like they thought of it. But, you know, we had to agree to the alternative site. Yeah, well, well we suggested it to you. Why wouldn't we? So we, we signed it. And they have said and told the senator, Kane, that the four acres that they owned in that area, they're going to give it back to the Monacan tribe. And you will be seeing things in the next 
several years were we going to try to do something with that land where my grandson and Rufus's grandchildren won't have to do that fight again. And Rufus was also a major player in getting all of this done. So uh, thank you, and again, thank I'll you. cherish this. Thank you. Well, that's what you love about history. You, you, you do some of the work, you present it, and then we add another layer. And I think we're going to see a lot of that over the next uh, day or two. Thank you very much, Chief Branham. We, all, we respect the inherent knowledge of the sovereign Indian nations of this land and acknowledge its value to all of us as we work together to build a sustainable future. Virginia Tech's mission as an institution includes reaching out to the diverse peoples, communities, and institutions in the New River Valley and beyond to share knowledge and ideas so that we can build that future together in the spirit of our motto, but pro sim, that I may serve. And on that note, it gives me great pleasure to welcome and introduce the mayor of the town of Blacksburg, Leslie Hager-Smith. In person, all right. <laughs> Thank you for having me here today. I'm delighted to be here. And you have given me uh, an image, Rufus, for uh, meadows and mountains uh, that will stay with me. It's how I experience our home, too. And um, I, I just really appreciate that. I have just a very, uh, I've been asked to make just a very few comments and to reflect on the relationship of the town and the university. And so uh, I'll start that now. In the modern age, we are acquainted with Blacksburg as a progressive community known for its outstanding university, resident services, climate, quality of life, schools, and natural beauty. As others here have pointed out already, though, what's important to understand about our town is that we did not spring fully formed out of the mountainside. We who are assembled here today are not the first who have come to this place on top of the world at the crest of the Eastern Divide and the headwaters of three major rivers, the James, the New, and the Roanoke Rivers. In this fortunate location, this land of mountains and meadows, our world expands from the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. It is a place that time out of mind has been traveled by the adventurous and sometimes the lost, asylum seekers, wanderers, and sometimes speculators, fugitives, and sometimes returnees. returnees. Collective, we have a, collectively, we have a long history of leadership and accomplishment, but also of strife and suffering. And so on this occasion, it is wise, as always, to remember that we drink from wells we did not dig, and we warm ourselves at fires that we did not kindle. Smithfield Plantation was built, as we all know, in 1774 by Colonel William Preston. It stood as an outpost of privilege and wealth and learning on what was then the western frontier of European expansion in this country. Three governors of the Commonwealth traced their roots to this remote place and the Preston family. It was in 1798 that the town of Blacksburg was founded but not until nearly 75 years later that it was incorporated in 1871. The Smithfield and the Preston family were not the only influences on education. One of the first institutions started here was the Blacksburg Female Academy in 1840. The town fathers, Methodists for the most part, later established the Olin and Preston Institute in 1851 for young men only. It was closed uh, when most of its teachers and students left to fight the Civil War. Struggling with debt, it was rechartered again after the war as the Preston and Olin Institute in 1869. Meanwhile, Virginia's post-war re-entry into the Union allowed the state to receive federal funds under the Morrill Land Grant Act to establish a new agricultural and mechanical college. 24 schools, including the University of Virginia, offered themselves, sorry, <laughs> offered themselves as the ideal site. In a surprising move, the state legislature chose Preston and Olin in what was then a rural backwater. 
Montgomery County residents had promised $20,000 to help build this college. As fortune would have it, the judge who presided over the legal arrangements was none other than the Blacksburg citizen whose father helped to found Preston and Olin to begin with. And so it was that the Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College, now Virginia Tech, came to be founded, born of equal parts financial desperation, Methodist evangelism, political will, business know-how, and possibly a dash of nepotism. When my neighbor Hugh Campbell moved his family to Blacksburg in 1956 to join the math department, there were just over 3,000 people living in this town. Now the undergraduate population alone is 10 times that. And Hugh still prospers in the home where he raised his family a walk from this campus. That's a lot of change in a lifetime. But the important things we do do not change. The life of this community and the university are inextric inextricably entwined. If Blacksburg is unwell or unlivable, the university cannot hope to prosper. The work that we undertake is a shared endeavor. Students come to our mountain home as youngsters, and together, Blacksburg and Virginia Tech furnish them a future, their unique place in the common wheel. In our embrace, they become productive adult members of the wider community. Thank you for having me here. I, I celebrate with you. Thank you, Mayor Hager-Smith and President Sands. I just want to see if this laser pointer works here. I don't know if, yep. Uh, and to thank Chief Branham for talking about Reswick, which is here, I believe. Uh, and it doesn't look like it's the center of, of travelways on this particular map because it has overland routes in red, but not the water. The, the rivers aren't very prominent in this particular map. But um, thank you for reminding us that as soon as we, as President Sands said, tell the stories, they change. And luckily, this, this story has had a happy ending. I'm not ready to work on seven more signs just yet, though. <laughs> so we're going <laughs> to, we're just going to have to teach that another way for now. <laughs> I just want to thank all of you again for being here to celebrate with us the unveiling of these seven. It looks like a lot more than this because you're seeing the back and the front at the same time. But these, uh, these seven historical markers that the subcommittee, the historical markers subcommittee, has been working on diligently, um, some more than others, Peter Wallenstein, for two full years. Um, and I want to uh, say that I hope you'll be back in, in May. By the end of May, hopefully, these will be installed physically around campus. And, and Lisa Morris, university architect, is going to help us understand where these are going to be, not the foam core version, but the, the built versions of these. I am just one member of the, the committee. Um, there are others here today that I want to also acknowledge. I think I saw Denny Cochran and Clara Cox. Where did Clara? Oh, right there next to Denny. Um, uh, Megan Marsh, Paul Quigley, um, Peter Wallenstein, and uh, Jack Rosenberger. There's. Um, no doubt that absolutely key is Peter Wallenstein, whose book provided the initial research for telling our institution's history. And we have, and I, I had one up here, the beautiful program, if you would wave it, President Sands, um, because there's so many more names in here as well that I hope you, you will notice how many different people have participated um, in, in the efforts that culminate this weekend and will continue. Here's just a... I know you can't read these, but just a quick sense of just for the markers alone, the people who provided their wisdom and expertise and feedback on the drafts over the last two years, and then the people who helped with the design um, and uh, actually built the physical side as well, uh, and people like Susan Anderson and others here who helped um, dig up images that many of which we were unable to use, but uh, we are grateful to everyone who took time to try to tell as full a story as possible. Um, and I wanted to say that 
the, the stakeholder groups were really important to me, that as we thought about what is the story if we only have seven signs worth of story to tell that we have room for, which stories and which voices, and how do we tell the stories differently this time around? And so I want to thank the people who contributed their knowledge, expertise, and passion, um, and weighed in on which stories are most crucial to tell, but also and especially which wording and uh, which images enhance our understanding of our history without reinscribing harmful stereotypes. So with the Black Stakeholders Group, we talked a lot about uh, minstrelsy and the damaging legacy of that and which images might um, be too complicated to put on a sign where we don't have a whole semester to unpack them. Um, we talked with indigenous stakeholders about the nuances of the word village versus the word town. And, and they were adamant that the word town should be here because it, it had a less sense of infantilizing or primitive. Um, so those voices, um, many, many dozens of voices uh, are represented here in trying to retell stories with more voices and more perspectives than have been able to be told in some of the longer standing markers um, on campus and around the state in the past. Um, so speaking of Lisa Morris, um, our, our committee's fearless leader, Jack, is unable to be here, sadly, um, after a shepherding, shepherding us through this uh, project all this time. So um, today we are lucky to be joined by Lisa Morris, Assistant Vice President for Planning and University Architect. And Lisa will describe some of the design and landscape considerations involved in making these history, histories visible um, that were key to um, augmenting the content experts and public historians who helped bring this project to fruition. Well, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And, um, you know, uh, Jack really wanted to be here because um, he was so directly embedded in this process and he sends his regrets. But uh, I'll do my best to fill in for him. Um, and we did have an opportunity to work very closely on this project. So I'm, I'm also very, very proud to be here today um, with all of you uh, to talk about these. Um, so uh, back in about 2018, um, we began uh, this process for developing a sign type and mitigation for um, some demolitions in the Upper Quad region. And so you know, we were working with the Department for Historic Resources, and that led us to create um, this new standard for an interpretive panel or historical marker, um, this uh, two-sided um, uh, marker opportunity. And we have four of these currently installed in and around the upper quad right now, with a fifth that will be coming as soon as we complete some construction activities in that area. And then you can see in the photo on the right, uh, one of the signs installed, and that one is located between Alumni Mall and um, some Corps of Cadets residence halls. And each one of these signs up in that location have a different theme to them. One of them uh, tells the story of Hokie Stone, and one tells the story of the Corps of Cadets and the Upper Quad, and so on. Um, and so uh, that gave us a, an opportunity to be able to have something to bring forward for future projects just such as this one. So if you want to advance to the next slide, Emily. Yeah. Um, and so when we, when we set out to designate locations for the historical markers related to this project, um, we had a sign type that we could utilize, which was really helpful. But we needed to also identify locations for each one of these. And that was um, a really important part of the process. Um, and so we applied a, a whole series of criteria in making those site selections. And so I'll just walk through some of those with you. Um, as we looked out across campus, uh, one of the first things that you may have noticed is we have a little bit of construction going on. I don't know if anybody noticed that. We'll come into our campus. Um, and, you know, we're sort of slated to continue with a lot of those construction activities over time. So we didn't want to select locations that 
would be um, we would be required to move these markers in another at another point in time. You know, we wanted to select locations that were going to be good and sound and worked within the framework of the master plan and and our long range planning. So that was an important piece. Um, we also wanted to select locations that had high visibility. We wanted a pedestrian nexus where there was lots of opportunity for pedestrians to interact with these historical markers. Uh, we thought that was very important. Um, we needed them to be in locations that were ADA accessible and universally available and open to all. That was such an important piece of this as well. Um, we wanted sites that also allowed us to leverage some of our existing infrastructure and it would be very important to have this adjacent to existing accessible routes so that um, the site could be accessed as we we're going across campus. Henderson Lawn. Uh, if you can see, there's a little key plan in the lower right-hand side um, that shows that, and, and all the streets and such aren't, aren't uh, indicated there, but this is uh, right on the edge between campus and town. 
And this marker is placed in close proximity to the physical beginnings of campus. Uh, with that direct relationship to uh, Henderson Lawn and this location as well, we are celebrating the relationship of the campus to the town of Blacksburg. And then this becomes part of a, a gateway moment, uh, the ceremonial entrance along a alumni mall into campus. And so we thought that that resonated and was really important, as well as a significant amount of pedestrian movement that will um, come in contact with this, with this sign. Just stay here. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to highlight my some favorite content on each of these as Lisa talks about where they're going to be. This I just love this photo because this is the the Preston and Olin building that would be in the middle of North Main Street where it's still standing today. So the fact that the sign will be placed as near to that intersection but with plenty of uh, lighting and pedestrian uh, traffic is um, seems right so that people can try to visualize where that first building would have been. Other thing I want to point out about this early years sign is that it features two people who were present at the very founding of Virginia Tech, its transition from Preston and Olin to Virginia Tech. Um, Andrew Oliver on the, well, this is his son actually on the right, who was formerly enslaved by members of the black family represented on the, the left. Um, and both of these uh, individuals carried over their, their roles uh, Black as rector and Oliver as custodian in the transition from the boys' school to the land-grant university. So our second, our second marker and its site is directly across from that uh, campus history marker, uh, also on Alumni Mall and directly adjacent to the Moss Arts Center. The land grant marker becomes part of that ceremonial gateway as well in, in, due to its location there. And we leveraged some existing site conditions here with the, the benches and the plaza space to really uh, create a nice uh, node right in that location. But also this location, it ties this historic marker to an existing directly adjacent Department of Historic Resources historical marker, which you can see, yes, thank you, it's just slightly there, which also talks about um, land grant. And it gives us the opportunity with that proximity to provide some really important additional context to what is currently on that um, DHR historical marker. Including, um, which was mentioned in the land acknowledgement, the fact that the sale of native lands made possible the, the founding of Virginia Tech, which isn't present on that older, the older marker. Right. I, I wanted to highlight from this sign, um, this map, because Stuart Scales, a Virginia Tech geographer, worked collaboratively with um, Sam Cook and Vicki Ferguson and a, a huge team of experts to try to uh, Tom Klotka, um, whose archaeological work with the state was really important, to try to help people. There, we didn't have a map like this before that helped place Virginia Tech, present day Virginia Tech, in the landscape of mountains and meadows that Chief Brandon was talking about before. Also, in the stakeholder group with the Native Americans, one of the things that was most important is that we not only talk about indigenous peoples in the past. And so uh, thanks to Melissa Faircloth and, and others with Native at BT, we were able to identify a photo that makes it very clear that um, Native peoples are still here, um, vibrant, ongoing, dynamic cultures and contributions. Our, our third site is um, the location for the Black Experience Marker. And as Emily uh, explained, you know, we had looked at many different locations and alternatives, and in the end selected this location um, in this uh, lovely wide location along Washington Street. And it provides a significant um, ex you know, exposure uh, opportunity, and it's at a pedestrian nexus. And it also is set up for uh, future pedestrian expansion because from this very point, it's the connection for a future green link into the core of campus. And a green link will be a, an ADA accessible route that will help us navigate that steep slope that's just off to the other side 
creating an accessible route from this location into the core of campus. And we also thought that that was a, a nice part of the story. Um, and then it is one block off from, from Clay Street, as Emily mentioned. From this sign, I wanted to uh, highlight the photos on the left from 1919 uh, uh, yearbooks. Um, and uh, the fact that the people who, some of the people whose labor made Virginia Tech possible were not able and their children were not able to attend the university. Um, and then the, on the right is a very special photo um, of Janie Hogue and um, Essex Finney on graduation day at the home where the eight, first eight black male students uh, lived with the Hogue family um, and walked to campus. And that was right there on Clay Street, right? And, that, and yeah. not right there, but Clay Street's right there, and then <laughs> about a half mile up, I believe. Was that, was their home? Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, so for our next site, this one is located on, uh, between Kent Street and Owens Hall Dining Facility. It's the location identified for the student diversity marker. And this site is an intersection of uh, many pedestrian paths that come together at this point and um, go directly into the student life district. They converge there. And so uh, we really like this location um, for this particular marker. And it also offered um, a natural plaza-like setting as well as some existing landscaping. And it's uh, kind of in a grove of trees there. So it's a really, it's a really great little site. This is just right outside here, right? Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful spot. Um, originally, we had two signs designated for black history and experience. And the black stakeholder group that convened um, urged us to consider using one of those two, reserving one for black history and experience, but using one of those two signs to tell um, a broader story about ethnicity and race and diversity. So this is the um, student diversity marker. and it. For that, that sign then was able, we were able to bring in diversity according to politics, including in the Vietnam War era, diversity according to religion, sexuality, um, disability, Appalachian identity, and more. Do you want to show the, the image? Oh, yes. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Um, and this actually is a good segue to this image, because one of my commitments what my voices is one of the many voices. One of mine was to not um, have only individual stories of individuals who broke barriers, um, you know, sort of pull yourself up by the bootstraps, but to always acknowledge the communities and networks that allowed people to um, go through very difficult, challenging circumstances and to acknowledge collectivities. And so this uh, image is of a 2003 rally in support of diversity according to race and sexual orientation. The Native's People, the Native People's Marker will be located along West Campus Drive uh, with open sweeping views along the Struble's Creek watershed that uh, connects the drill field landscape through to the duck pond landscape. And um, so Struble's Creek runs under the drill field at, at, that, at that location, um, but it really shaped that landscape. And so we really like this site for, for those reasons. And uh, this accessible route also that connects across the bridge connects further into uh, this landscape. This is one of um, a special uh, consequence of this project is that we have an illustration that was designed specifically for these markers by a Virginia Tech graduate, Mary Kay Clater, who used the archaeological evidence from what is called the Shannon site, which is the town, uh, the Waisa town, Monacan Alliance town that was on the North Fork River in what is now Ellet Valley. So she used the archaeological evidence to reconstruct in an illustration what life might have looked like at that site in Ellet Valley, and then went, she brought that draft to Vicki Ferguson and other experts um, who helped her refine it um, and try to try to imagine how to try to help people imagine some of the peoples who were on this this land long before Virginia Tech. 
The marker for solitude is located on an accessible primary pedestrian route through, through the grounds of solitude. Uh, it is within the boundaries of that National Historic Register property. And so we did coordinate with the Depart Department of Historic Resources on this location, and they were very supportive of the placement right here along the walkway at kind of the primary entrance into the site. Um, and we felt that we really like this location also because we felt it provided a really great opportunity uh, for some excellent interpretive um, sign or signage there. So this sixth sign educates us on the slave plantation history of Virginia Tech. Oh, thank you. Yes, Lisa, thank yeah. you. Sure. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the history that we know about, thanks in part to the hard work of Dr. Dan Thorpe, who is here today, Dr. Kira Mosley-Hobbs, who is here today, among others. And uh, if Greg Porter is watching on the live stream, special thanks to you for helping Appalachian Studies preserve and restore the buildings here that help us, the Fraction Family House on the left and the Solitude House um, in the center that help us interpret this complicated history. And then these images um, are uh, some that really spoke to the Solitude Advisory Committee because they um, are a sense of agency uh, from the, the Fraction Brothers who chose to leave this site and uh, enlist in the Union Army during the Civil War. And our final location for the final sign, um, during our site walk, we discovered this really amazing little spot for the women's history marker. So it'll be located right between the library and Kent Street. And this niche seemed ready-made uh, for, for this sign and this marker, this location with this little plaza-like setting and seating and landscaping there. Um, and then there were some other really in intriguing reasons why this was such a, a, a good location for that marker. One reason this particular site makes sense for women's history is that it features Mary G. Lacey, who was appointed the university's first librarian in 1903. And this was one of the few professions open to white women on campus at the time. And then this is also featured on the women's history. This is um, a store, the, the tin horn, the alternative to the bugle, since uh, women were not featured in, in the bugle. This comes to us through Anna. Lomascolo, who I think is here today, and the Women's History Trail that you put on, I think with a lot of help from Kira Dietz, maybe in the library. Um, so th this is just another example of how many people have been doing this work for so many years to try to unearth these stories and keep them alive. So thank you to the Women's Center for their help with that. And uh, with that, I would just like to say we're so thankful that um, we've had the opportunity to introduce these markers out into the landscape uh, of campus and that they will become a part of our culture now. Thank you. I just again want to thank uh, the many, many people who were involved in conceptualizing, researching, debating, uh, and doing the immense legwork for these historical markers. Um, there is food waiting for you. If there are questions, we can take questions or we can have questions and, and answers in small groups as well. Um, but we do want to make sure that we have left you hungry for more, not just for the food in the back, um, but for more 1872 forward events, uh, including these events tomorrow. Again, you have a brochure you can take with you to make sure you don't forget where to go for those. Um, back here at Owens for the launch of um, the, the interim version of Peter Wallenstein's book uh, and the dedication of Hogan Whitehurst Falls and then at the Moss Center storytelling song, dance and poetry. Uh, tomorrow we will have ceremony at the Mary Tree uh, as well as contested spaces, spaces conversation about the tri-racial history of this land. Um, the reception at 4 to 6 has been moved from the Solitude and Fraction Family House to Han Hall Atrium in anticipation of the weather. And then on Sunday, the grandmother of Juneteenth, Ms. Opal Lee. I, I don't want to, I, I'm trying to read the room like 
Bob Leonard asked me to, but I'm not very good at it. He's had a lot more practice at that. Um, it, if we're ready for to, to go move on into uh, smaller conversations, if not, wave your hand. Ellington, you got something to say? Somebody, anybody? OK. Uh, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brett Clark. Um, as we leave here today, I hope that we will cherish the examination of the complicated histories of the ground on which we walk. Thank you so much for being here.